Good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2019. Can I remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones? Agenda item one is consideration of whether to take agenda items four and five in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. That is agreed. Agenda item two, the committee will hold its second evidence session on empty homes in Scotland. I'd like to welcome Sarah Jane Lane, Executive Director, Scottish Lands and Estates, Andrew Mitchell, Regulatory Services Manager, Housing and Regulatory Services, City of Edinburgh Council, Joan McClellan, Senior Strategy Officer, Corporate and Housing Services, Falkirk, Maureen Flynn, Strategy and Policy Advisor, Housing and Technical Resources, South Lanarkshire Council, and Isabel Butt, Vacant Property Development Officer, Perth and Kinross Council. Now, we'll move st straight on to the questions. I'd like to start with Graham Simpson. Thanks very much, convener. Morning, everyone. Um, we, we had the Scottish Empty Homes Partnership uh, before us just the, just the other week, and, and their view is that every council should have a dedicated empty homes officer. Um, so I'm not sure, because I haven't checked which, which uh, among you have that, but perhaps you could say, if you do, um, what difference that makes, and if you don't, why don't you, and whether you think it matters. Maybe if I go first, then um, I think Edinburgh is in the process of changing. So we had an empty homes officer. The committee decided a couple of years to mainstream it in order to make a broader base of staff doing that. Uh, recently, as part of the council's budget, there's an agreement to fund once again an empty homes officer. So we are currently in the process of recruiting to that post in order to give a renewed focus on empty homes. Okay. We, we um, have an empty homes officer. We've had an empty homes officer, officer since 2003. Um, we are part of a shared service initially with um, Black Manager Council and Stirling Council. But since 2016, we've had our own dedicated empty homes officer. Um, we now have two empty homes officers and, and they share, um, um, they work on buybacks and empty homes and it's made a, a big difference to to us, um, the number of empty homes that we've brought back, we've brought back um, the last six years um, just over 400 empty properties back into use. Mm. That's, that's impressive. So you went from having no empty homes officer yeah. to two? Yeah, um, it's one full time equivalent. They do work on our buyback scheme as well, two officers. Okay. And this is Falkirk Council? It's Falkirk Council. Right, yes. okay. <coughs> South Lanarkshire Council, um, we don't have a dedicated, well, we have a development and private sector team and part of their remit, part of their responsibility is in relation to empty homes and the open market purchase buybacks that you mentioned as well. Um, the thinking behind that is that we want to ensure a strategic approach to empty homes and linking it clearly back to our local housing strategy. And we think that that is, um, in terms of effectiveness and resources, we think that's a, the right response in South Lancashire. Strategic approach is, um, <laughs> is council speak. And, <laughs> and not many people outside of councils will know what, what, what you mean by that. Yeah. I think we just want to make sure that the let's say the link back to our local housing strategy, which is where we would kind of identify our priorities in terms of housing supply and demand within South Lanarkshire. So the the, the the development and private sector team fit in as part of that overall approach. And let's say they, they, they have a wider they have a wider remit, they, they look at the empty homes. Um, but also open market purchase and also um, housing supply across South Lanarkshire. So it's part of that, I, I would just a, a more holistic approach, I think, is maybe a way to put it. Market purchase is um, waiting until houses are on the market. It's, yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. not tackling empty homes. Necessarily. I'm just mentioning that in, cons in relation to the fact that it's a wider, the team has a wider remit. Okay, and um, Isabel Butt? Uh, yes, we've had, in Perth and Kinross Council, we've had um, empty homes officers since 2012. 
Um, we deal with it slightly differently because we are in um, planning and development, whereas all the other empty homes officers sit in housing. So there's two of us who work part-time, so it's 1.6 um, full-time equivalent. And we bring back 150 empty homes per annum. We're on target this year for that. 150 a year? A year. And how long has that been going on for? Um, well, it's, it's since... Um, 2012. Right. But it's not been 150 every year. That's no. their target for this year. And that's assisted by having an empty homes officer, you Definitely, think? Definitely, yes. So that so makes a big difference. Yeah. Okay, that's that's very useful. Um, can I ask um, about um, the use of uh, the, the council tax levy, uh, which is available to you for empty homes? Um, and whether any of you have used that and how you've used it. Again, the position in Edinburgh is I think the council is utilising those powers to its maximum. There is a staged process of depending on how long the property is empty and the money generated is then used to contribute to the council's affordable homes. So the council is, wherever possible, exercising that income stream as a way of funding other things and of discouraging homes from remaining empty. So you do, so you do use this, but in every case? I, I think there is some discretion for some extreme cases, but in the vast majority of cases, I think the council will use that and will not apply the, the percentage. OK. Um, we've been using the levy since um, 2017. Um, and it's for properties that have been empty for more than 12 months. Um, we do have discretionary, we do have discretion. They can apply for discretion if the, um, the property is undergoing major works. Um, discretion is, is for 50% and it's usually for six months, although they can apply for further discretion after the six months as well. Um, and it's used to, to fund the empty homes officer. Oh, the extra money goes towards paying for the... Empty Towards homes officer. Yeah. Okay. And and how, how many people in, in the Falkirk area have yeah, asked for discretion to be applied? I'll be honest, I don't know. Okay. I, I need to come back to you with that. Right. Okay. Maureen? Um, we introduced the additional levy in April of this year. So it's, um, it's fairly new within South Lanarkshire. Um, we also carried out a full review as part of the preparations for introducing it. And that's resulted in some changes of categorisation so to, in terms of the information that we have. Let's say we carried out a review in advance of starting the additional levy. Um, in terms of discretion, there is limited discretion. There is discretion primarily for um, where it's a new owner of a property, taking on a property, taking on an empty home. Right, I'm going to come back to you on the discretion question, but if we can hear from Isabel. We've used um, the levy for the last two years, um, and we use discretion with it as well, and I think the carrot and stick approach has worked very well. Um, and it's been about um, 70 properties per annum over these last years, so it's 140 in total that we've given discretion for, where um, owners are working to repair their property, so we would give them 90%. Um, um, council tax charge for 18 months while they're doing the work. Right, well, let's, let's just come back um, to that because we had a, a session in private uh, with people from ver various areas uh, of Scotland, but there were some from South Lanarkshire, the rural part of South Lanarkshire. Um, and so the question arises around this this discretionary power which uh, you don't, don't appear to be applying in South Lanarkshire. So we had some people who... Uh, whose homes um, had, had become empty or, or they'd bought empty homes, wanting to do them up. Um, they clearly wanted to renovate them. They were renovating them. And then they were hit with this extra council tax charge. And these are not rich people. So that then appears to have meant, according to what we heard as a committee, that, 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 was, that, that could actually affect the renovation work it could actually be, mean that these homes would be empty for longer than they would be. Uh, 
and I, I, I guess the councils that apply the discretion are doing it for that very reason. So why, why are you not doing that in South Lanarkshire? Um, as I say, we, the, the scheme has just been newly introduced in South Lanarkshire since April of this year. Um, obviously, we're monitoring the introduction of the scheme and the effectiveness of the scheme and, and the, whether, you know, the encouragement, because it is a carrot and stick approach in terms of encouraging owners to bring their properties back into use. And we're monitoring that closely to see do we need to rebalance it in any way or is it acting as in the way that we expected or anticipated it would? Um, the, in terms of um, discretion, I think the distinction has been made between um, owners who have owned the property for a number of years and haven't, for whatever reason, brought it back into use and new owners who are looking actively to bring the property into use. Um, I think that's the, the distinction. But like I say, what we are doing is monitoring that closely to see is there any rebalancing needing done or is it working in the way that we anticipated? Well, according to what we heard, there wasn't much monitoring going on because uh, the, the, the individuals we spoke to were hardly having any contact from the council. And I think that would be the advantage of having an empty homes officer is that there would be a, a direct contact um, and, and it just seemed to me, it sounded more stick than carrot, What your, your approach. The, the development and private sector team, the team are available to provide information and advice and support to owners. So it's, it's we, you know, we don't have a named individual, we have a team. And from our point of view, that was actually better insofar as you weren't, you, you were having that across a wider group of people, that ability to provide information and advice and support to owners was a team responsibility as opposed to an individual. Okay. Do you monitor, I guess this could apply to all of you, um, how long properties have remained empty, um, any sort of serious cases, like, you know, up to a, maybe a property's been empty for over five years, say. Do you, do you have records of that kind of thing? Our records could always be more sophisticated, but yes, in general terms, we're able to <coughs> roughly know how many years a property has been empty. Um, in terms of Edinburgh's approach, our activity is focused largely at properties that are causing community problems, uh -huh. which are a number, and which in terms of the resource available, that's who we choose to target that resource at, but we do keep some statistics. Right. We do have um, a date for when the property, an approximate date when the property became empty. So we do have an idea of properties um, that have been um, empty for a longer um, period of time. And we do try and target them as much as we can and try and engage with the owner as much as we can. Okay. Um, yes, likewise. Um, our database comes from council tax. So we know how long they've been empty and they're the ones that we prioritise along with yeah. And South Lanarkshire? We, we also are able to tell how long the properties, yeah. We, yes, we have records of how long, based on council tax records as well, of how long the property's been empty. And do you prioritise those cases? Not specifically, no. Either, no. No, you don't, because um, when I was a councillor in, in East Kilbride, uh, there was a, there's a house in, in my ward in the, the Mossnuke area. This is my final question, convener. Um, and that has been empty and boarded up for over 10 years. It's a blight on, on the area where it's in. Nothing's been done. Um, so that's the kind of example where, in my view, an empty homes officer could be taking proactive action um, to get that house back into use. So if you, you know, if you kept proper records and took action on it, you know, we, we yeah, we could we could we could see some improvement. We have records. We we have this, we share the same records as other authorities are are seeing as well. I think Sarah Jane wants to. If that's okay, convener, just from a property owner's point of view, the um, the lack of consistency in application of the discretion when it comes to the council tax levy is quite frustrating. Um, it's not just South Lanarkshire. We're currently dealing with cases in Scottish <coughs> Borders Council and Midlothian uh, Council areas just now, 
where people have active plans <coughs> to, you know, active repair plans. Some of them are actually waiting for building warrants from from the council, mm -hmm. and they're having um, the, you know, the, the 200% levy applied without mm -hmm. any any discussion. And just to pick up on your first point about the value of empty homes officers, feedback from our members um, is that they really value the support which is given by dedicated um, empty team, uh, empty homes officers or, or teams because they can actually bring in other disciplines from the council and you can you can draw in expertise um, but you, they, you know they, they, these guys really understand the issue that's being faced by the owners of the properties so it's it's definitely a valued resource thanks Galena. thank you Graham. Uh, Alexander you want to just just following on from mr. Simpson's questions can I ask about town centre uh, w which have empty properties now the majority we found, especially in, in, in that location, would be a, maybe a business on the ground floor, uh, and then on the first or second floor, uh, there, are, there are empty properties. Can I ask how you've been tackling that specific issue? Um, because that seems to be one of the bigger uh, problems in ensuring that we get people back into living and dwelling within uh, a city centre. If I can kick off on that, actually, my first job, uh, first full-time job, which was longer ago than I'd like to admit here, um, was for Roxburgh District Council, um, tackling that very problem, you know, 25, nearly 30 years ago. Um, still, still got the problem. But again, it was about an individual property um, basis. You, there wasn't a blanket approach. But what we did was, was look at them as sort of joint housing and economic um, development. Um, so we tackled it together rather than tackling the housing and, and, and the properties separately. And, and that seemed to, seemed to work, thinking about the regeneration that happened in, in Hoyk and Kelso um, at the time. But it was also linked to long-term leasing. And one of the things that, that, that did work was rather than just sort of saying to people, bring these properties back into use, let them to whoever you want, you tied them into um, arrangements with the local authority. Um, and it's still relevant today so that you ensure that the housing supply isn't just the short term, it's that long term housing supply. But it was about incentives, you know, that it, it was about money, it was about helping these people bring their properties back into use. We do um, sort of concentrate on town centres and we have got a grant scheme that um, will assist owners. So we've used some of the council tax money to set up small grant schemes. One of them is a feasibility fund which if somebody is needing um, architects drawings or um, quantity surveyors or engineers, we can match fund their fees. Um, and also we've got an empty homes initiative grant where we give a grant to for conversion of commercial to residential or upgrading residential properties and that's tied into a, um, lo a local um, housing allowance rental for five years. Uh, Anybody else have any comments? Is, if I could just come in, uh, as part of our affordable housing supply programme, we are actively identifying sites within town centre areas as well for um, just what you're saying, where, where it's maybe fallen into disrepair or... Um, it would be a regeneration project to bring properties back in in the town centre areas, and particularly looking at Hamilton and East Kilbride. Okay. Thank you. okay. Uh, can I just ask a couple of questions uh, based on your earlier responses? Why did Edinburgh decide to do away with their empty homes officer in the first place? Was it just a purely budget decision which ended up costing them money? Uh, no, not at all. So, although we didn't have a dedicated empty homes officer, we had a member of staff who had that within the role. And actually, one of the significant challenges we face is having people to go on the ground and go and visit these properties and inquire. So, that element of that was co-located between one of my teams who have responsibility for private rented sector property anyway and who are out on the ground carrying out inspections of <laughs> visiting the community. And the thinking was that that element of the work better sat amongst those teams. And what we will move to in the next few months is that element of work will continue to sit on the, on the grounds with that teams. However, there will be an empty homes officer in order to give a focus within the council for that. So I don't think it was a, a budgetary measure. It was thinking that the resource needed to be doing that footfalls, finding the properties, inquiring about wh where the, the ownership was and dealing with individual property owners. That uh, you thought you could do it without the empty homes officers and you're now finding you need the empty homes officer because it gives a point of contact for both 
the, uh, the, the tenant, the, well, the, the yeah. homeowners. Uh, indeed, I, I, I need to be somewhat careful because these are different committee decisions taken by different administrations, but the current thinking is that it, it needs a renewed focus of having that empty homes officer attacked as the point of contact, which would build upon, I suppose, the having the officers on the ground. OK, thank you. And, and I'm afraid I have to go back to South Lanarkshire and ask uh, why you've just implemented the, the empty homes. Sorry, the, what, the, why, the why, levy? Why, yeah, 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 the levy. Um, Seems to be a bit behind others and, and, and having implemented it. Right. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure of the answer to that. I can yeah. find out the background to that and come back to you. OK, but it takes... Again, it takes us to, it looks like South Lanarkshire are doing things a wee bit differently than, than most of the other places. And Do you have any statistics that show that the method that you're taking has been more successful than, than the, the empty homes, the uh, well, officers, the methods that the others have shown today? Um, I take the point that was made earlier that any empty home is, is something that we want to look at and can potentially cause problems within a community. I take that point. But at South Lanarkshire... We are well below the national average in terms of empty homes. Um, the empty homes in South Lanarkshire in September 18 was 0.62. Um, I understand that since we've carried out the review and introduced a levy, because of recategorisation, that has fallen further and is likely to be much lower than that again. So I think what we think is that We've got this uh, wider approach, a team to help and provide adv advice and information, and that the way that we've set up is effective for the circumstances that exist within South Lanarkshire. So, you know, while I'm not minimising any having any empty homes, I think we feel that our approach is effective and is working. Um, uh, certainly, the evidence we got in the private session suggests that uh, the, the need for someday that people with concerns could. Uh, contact a named person w would be really, really beneficial. So I would suggest that South Lanarkshire at least look at, at trying to make sure that the information is out there for where they should go. The, the information is out there. I mean, we have a, a when we when we were contacting um, any owners, you know, in re relation to the introduction of the levy, we produced a leaflet. We've got information on our website. We, we signpost owners to the team and to the availability of the team to provide advice and information. Okay. Uh, can I just ask a number of other questions? What do you think are the main reasons why homes become and remain empty? Yeah. I mean, there's, an, there's a number of reasons. There's not one overall reason. I don't think there's... Um, it's poor marketing. Um, they've got other priorities. They've not realised, you know, how much time and money it will take to refurbish a property. Um, there's issues with, with repossession, um, the death of a family member. Um, the reasons can be really, really complex, and they usually require, um, you know, the empty homes officer to give them specific advice and tailored advice and information to help them bring it back into use. <coughs> A landlord's point of view, I suppose there's another couple. One is money. Um, you know, the, the financial costs of bringing properties up to the standard now required to, to, to let um, in, in relation to the repairing standard and energy efficiency. You know, everyone wants to have high standard homes, but the costs of bringing some of these very poor quality properties, and there are some very poor quality properties in rural areas, up to a standard. You have a high yeah, standard home. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we all want that. Yeah. Uh, and landlords want to be able to deliver, deliver that, but the cost of bringing them up to that is, is probably greater than, than many of them realised, um, either when they brought the property or when they've looked at the property. Um, there's also risks um, from a landlord's point of view. Some of these are, are, are not real risks. They are perceived risks, but a lack of understanding, possibly, about the new private residential tenancies and, and how they um, how it works. Worries about um, being able to get your property back. And that's where the empty homes officers can actually offer advice um, to those landlords who maybe are just uh, you know, un unaware um, of um, of the realities of the, te the tenancy regime, especially those people who are um, who've inherited properties and suddenly become um, landlords by default. We find at the moment there's lots of people looking for advice um, and and shelter do do a great job, but you've still got some landlords who are really reluctant to let properties because of this perceived risk to their asset. Andrew. 
Uh, I think the, the issue about markets, I think, isn't one that applies in Edinburgh, given the strength of the housing market in Edinburgh. I think where we come across issues are people actively choosing to sit on the asset and not wishing to dispose of it. And we have had examples of people, when we engage with them, saying, what has it got to do with the council? It's our property, we're leaving it vacant. So there is some issues there. Again, from an Edinburgh perspective, because of our HMO market and student market, the issues about the private, um, the repairing standards, and that is just not an issue we face locally. Because the demand for student accommodation and for short-term lets is such that you know any property that's you know sitting there vacant and somebody might want to sell, there's quite a market for it in Edinburgh to buy. Different problem from some other areas in Scotland. Uh, did anybody else, Isabel? Did you want? Um, well, I think one of the other things is that a lot of empty homes, they're actually the owners are actually working on them, but it's maybe ill health or something like that, and it's just taking a very long time. Or quite often, maybe tradesmen buy properties to work on when they're quiet, and they're, they're not quiet. So things are happening, but just very slowly. And I think that's where the discretion helps as well, that they've got a fixed time scale, and they know that if they don't have it back in use, then it'll be back on the 200% council tax. Well, yeah, in a case like that, then... The advice is to continue to keep in touch with the council and, and let them know what's going on and show evidence of what's what's going on, etc. Yeah. Okay, Kenny, you wanted to come in on this? Yes. Just uh, what Mr Mitchell touched on, morning panel, um, you, you talked about um, the issue of people perhaps sitting on properties for speculative reasons, and I noticed that in all of the responses that came in, you were the only one who suggested there should be additional powers, and you mentioned uh, compulsory sales orders, which are already being considered. Uh, but you do have some caveats about that in, with regard to um, the, the potential, um, uh, you know, legal um, issues which could occur. Could you just talk us a wee bit through how you think that could work uh, and and, and uh, the drawbacks that you think may be involved as well? Yeah, so I suppose our experience is there's one end, you could have advice, guidance and support to landlords to bring the properties back to use. At the other end of the scale, your only other option is compulsory purchase order, which I think this council is considering in a small number of cases, but given the cost and the legal risk, that is not really a tool that could be deployed in large scale. So between those two, there is really nothing. And what the council has said is that it is interested in the compulsory sales aspect of it, but it would depend on how that then comes out of Parliament and what that actually looks at. I think if it was a process as complicated and as costly as the compulsory purchase order, then that would be less attractive to the Council. If it was something a bit more slicker, for want of a better description, or less onerous or less risky financially to the Council, then that would be something that the Council certainly would consider. But until the detail of that is known, it's difficult to say, other than the Council was interested and thinks there's probably a gap between, as I say, advice and support and compulsory purchase. Yeah, I mean, my understanding is we've obviously still to see any prospective legislation on that, but the idea is it's to be fairly simple and straightforward. We buy properties where nobody's done anything with for years that are effectively um, put up for auction. But, but I notice no one else raised that particular issue. I'm just wondering what, what the other members of the panel think about that particular um, policy a, a tool, specifically for, empty, obviously for empty homes in your area, where it would be useful. I think it would be um, useful. Um, we don't tend to use CPO for single dwellings, or we haven't up till now, but we are looking at using it for um, large eyesore properties, maybe in the town centres, like big hotels and things like that. But I think there is a case for CPO, but if, if compulsory sales... Well, yes, for C using CPO, but also I think definitely compulsory sales orders would be good if they are quicker and simpler to use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's key, yes. I would agree with Lucy's comments that I think it'd be a, a useful tool, um, just depending on how um, easy it is to apply and simple. I think it would just be good to just have another option available, um, um, as well as you know, advice and information and CPO. Um, any other options are always, you know. Okay, in Scottish Land and Estates. Issues with the use of compulsory sale orders mm -hmm. um, when they were first talked about. I mean, the arson is that that you know that last stop. You know, when all other intervention has has failed, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and and as long as they are used, they're workable for the local authorities. Then surely they'll be more effective than the CPO regime, which which isn't being used at the moment. Um, and of course, the, there are other um, wider 
land reform measures that communities can use as well as local authorities. Um, I think the neglect and abandon provisions might offer opportunities for, um, for areas where there are empty properties for a community to ac actually exercise their rights if the local authority doesn't want to do that. So that enforced sale um, as a backstop is something that, that we as property owners um, accept in, in extreme situations. Thank you for that. Thanks, Kavya. OK, uh, Alec? Yeah, can I just briefly go back to the council tax? Um, how successful has the councils have the ability to have this this surcharge? How successful has that been? You know, has it has it increased the number of homes coming back in? Um, yes, I would say it definitely has. Um, we've found, you know, that we were saying we're 70 properties per annum, and now rather than us having to write out to empty home owners, they're now phoning council tax complaining about the surcharge and they're put directly through to us. So we're finding it much easier to engage with <coughs> homeowners because they're already contacting the council rather than us having to, to get in touch with them, which is usually by letter or something, not, not often not often not replied to. Yeah. And the flexibility, this 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 question, because that's what, what people who have experienced were saying that that it seems to be a hit or a mess depending on what authority. Do you think there needs to be better guidance, further guidance in terms of flexibility. What we seem to be hearing in, in, in one of the sessions was that, that people were trying to get their, 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 their house fixed and they were coming up against other barriers and then to top it all off they were then being, being um, told they had to pay uh, double council tax and that they said meant that it was, it was delaying them having the funding to actually get the house back into a decent shape. So this flexibility, is it? Who, 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 who decides in terms of flexibility and, and is there a need for further guidance? I think because the guidance is, is just guidance, I think um, every local authority seems to be <coughs> in interpreting it differently. So, um, I mean, I, I don't know if it needs to be more explicit and needs to actually say that, you know, there needs to be discretion or a certain amount, you know, it needs to be six months discretion. I'm not sure, but... Um, there seems to be differences between every local authority. Um, when we introduced our surcharge, we didn't initially have discretion. Um, and then we were finding lots of cases where people were coming to us and saying, well, I just can't afford to do this work. So we had to actually put these cases to our um, revenues manager and he then did a paper to the council. But it might be that there is a case that is not rather than discretionary, it's part of the legislation, possibly. Perhaps get a look at that paper that, that, that you're talking about. Um, and, and the final point I would make is, you mentioned that you used some of that additional funding for, for to support town centre housing development. Um, what about other authorities? That, that extra funding that's coming in, how is it? Is it used to try and support getting more empty homes back into, into ownership and use? I think, as I explained earlier, I think the funding stream in Edinburgh is mainly used to supplement the affordable homes, given the council is trying to build thousands of new homes in order to deal with some of the housing issues in the city. That was a political decision of the council that money coming in from that would be used to supplement and support that, um, and in effect be put to positive use, rather than paying for existing council services. So basically, yeah, it's been used for the supply of affordable homes, then. yeah. Yeah. Um, used to, to help fund you know, the empty homes officer. Yeah. As you know, it's, it's only recently been introduced, and the impact and the effect on the revenue streams is still to be assessed. And uh, we also use it for salaries for the empty homes staff as well. OK, right, thanks very much. Annabel? Thank you, computer morning uh, panel. Um, returning to the issue of enforcement, so um, on the issue of compulsory purchase orders, I think it was Falkirk Council in their submission who said that you've used it twice. Um, any indication of the usage in other council areas represented here today? Yep, so we took a report through committee at the request in um, January of this year. Um, we have identified about four or five quite problematic properties which have been sitting boarded up 
cause of antisocial behaviour and concern in the community, having been challenged by councillors to see what more we could do. The option is, of course, compulsory purchase. The downside, I suppose, of that is funding the compulsory purchase order, whereas the advice we're getting is that you could be up to twenty, thirty thousand pounds per property, and whilst you might recoup that at an eventual sale, um, as a, an upfront cost. So we are currently working our way through some business cases in order to ask for financial permission to pursue some of these compulsory purchase orders in the most problematic cases. Can I ask so you you say that you've been given advice that it could be the cost could be anything between twenty to thirty thousand. But what are the co you know? That's well. First of all, that's quite a, mo a wide margin of of uh, variation, and also what it, what is the principal cost, and what are the costs, and how is that broken down? The principal cost is raising the court action, and the risk factor, as I understand it, I mean, I'm, I'm not from our legal service, but the risk factor is if the court process is um, disputed and fought, um, the more, li the, you know, the more uh, resistant to the compulsory purchase order the person is, the higher the legal costs. Okay. Um, and so, sorry, South Lanarkshire? Uh, our main focus is on um, information, advice and support and liaison with other departments within the council to see how we can move the... Um, bring the property back into use, that we would only consider a compulsory purchase order in exceptional circumstances. Have there been any uh, recent...? Or not that I'm aware yeah. of, but I, I will come back to you on that, okay. not that I'm aware of. Um, Person can um, We've had one, but not in the recent past, some okay. time ago. OK, so obviously there's a, a feeling that uh, the CPO route is, is not your first choice, um, and uh, Mr Gibson has uh, uh, aired the issue of the compulsory sale order powers, which we would hope to see. But short of that, in the interim, I mean, pr presumably councils have other enforcement options available. Is that not the case? Work notices, for example, maintenance orders? So short of trying to tackle ownership um, by CPO, I mean, there are other routes. And I just wondered what, what extent, if any, local authorities make use of these other powers that they currently have. I suppose so. My teams within the council would deal with these kind of powers. I think I would describe them as powers to uh, mitigate problems. Um, yes, they, I feel somebody's having water ingress because of an empty home above them, or there's a, a problem caused by safety, then the council has powers to intervene. However, that doesn't often move as much forward in terms of resolving the empty homes. It's, it's mainly a case of managing the impact of it as opposed to solving the long-term empty homes problem. And again, I, I think you'll f my suspicion is you'd find this patchy across Scotland because in doing so, the council is taking on the financial risk of if you enter the property, you repair the property to solve the problem then, unless you can find the owner to get them to pay the bill, um, then you bear the cost. So I, I'm not sure to what extent those powers are actively used across the country. And but in, for example, the, oh, we'll get on to the issue of tracing ownership, which is an interesting issue you raise in, in a minute. But with regard to uh, the examples you gave a, a moment ago about properties with regard to which the council is actively looking at the cost-benefit analysis of CPOs, yeah. in circumstances where... Um, you have you anticipate that there could be a challenge so that the owner is not going to uh, just lie down and give up the property that would suggest that those would be circumstances where actually you could seek to have the owner or seek to have repairs effected and that the owner would have to pay up so what analysis do you do of, of that because it seems that there will be circumstances in which if you if you feel that the risk of challenge to the cpo is such that there must be other things that can be done to get, if there is an active owner or at least an identifiable owner, shall we say, to, to have the owner pay out so that the building's not an eyesore, which one can think of many across uh, Scotland, I, for example. 
um, I take your point, but I, I don't think there is powers to stop a building being an eyesore. I think there's a powers to stop it if it's causing a nuisance to other residents or the wider community. Going out of the windows and all that kind of stuff. And, and again, that's a, you could argue that's a nuisance or it would make the property unsafe. If it is just boarded up and looking unsightly, I'm not aware of any specific power which would allow the council to require the owner to do something about that. Certainly, I'd need to go back and double check, but... My view is that the properties we are considering a compulsory purchase order is where we've exhausted all options of engaging with the owner and they are simply either not able or not unwilling to for various reasons to move forward and therefore the compulsory purchase order is the last option the council has to bring a resolution. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yes, yes. Um, there are um, powers that we have. Definitely empty homes officers don't have any enforcement powers, but um, we speak to building standards and environmental health. Difficulty is building standards, are, they're more concerned with public safety mm -hmm. for a building, and if a building is dangerous, or they're more concerned about um, just fencing it off and keeping the public away, um, or possibly replacing, removing some slates that have fallen off or something like that. That's what their concern is rather than build, bringing the property back into use. Um, and also, it's the bud comes down to budgets. Again, they don't Environmental health and building standards don't have budgets to carry out the work, um, and if, if there's no chance of getting the money back, often we can't put a charge on the titles for some of the legislation. So it's just too much of a risk, and they don't have the money to to do that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts from Falkirk and um, There is a reluctance to use work notices because, again, because of the budget costs. Um, if you do serve a notice and we have to go in and, and undertake the work and not being able to get the money back from the owner um, and just not having the budgets available in the council. It's, it's just too risky, really. OK. Um, uh, Mr Mitchell raised the interesting question of, of um, where the owner is, is not readily identifiable. And I just wonder, in, what, in those circumstances, what steps are open to you at the moment to, to try to trace uh, the identity of the owner? Um, it is very difficult, I think, once you've exhausted the normal means of trying to trace the owner on the land register, letter the property, to ask neighbours, etc., inquire with the police. Um, we have a significant number of cases where we don't know the reason why they're empty, simply because we cannot find or get in contact with whoever happens to be the occupier or owner of the building, and that in itself is a challenge. Um, it is more likely to be the case if somebody is perhaps in hospital. Um, uh, that c can be traced sometimes, but often not. Or if a death, you know, who who has the estate, where to contact him, etc. There is no immediately obvious place to go to find that information, and it's a real barrier in some of our cases. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, examples or? or areas where you find it a, a, a potential solution to these conundrums? We can use um, sort of people finding companies to try and trace owners um, or the Queen's and Lord's Treasurer's Remembrancer mm -hmm. is a useful um, point of contact as well, where it's a property where somebody's maybe died without leaving a will or something like that. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, in terms of the tracing of, of ownership, are there any things that you feel would help local authorities? Any uh, improvements that could be brought about that could help you in your task? Any particular obstacles at the moment? I mean, you mentioned, for example, um, Mr Mitchell, um, somebody being in hospital and that you, you might manage to, to trace them, presumably if there were some way of... of um, dealing with data protection issues that might help local authorities? Uh... And again, I think your examples are based on feedback on the ground. You can then join the dots and then think that person might be in hospital, then you go and ask the questions mm -hmm. of the relevant section. But unless you have that indication, there is no you know, central register of who happens to be in hospital at any one time. So it is often by field work that mm -hmm. gets you that, but that in itself is resource intensive. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry, yeah. The owner lives abroad, mm -hmm. um, even Southern Ireland, you know, we have difficulty tracking people down, or if the property is owned by a company or a trust um, which is registered abroad, it's just virtually impossible to mm -hmm. get in contact with the owner. Okay, thank you. Right, thanks very much. Just on that 
question. How, is there a limit to how long a, a property can be lying empty where you can't get in contact with the owner despite the fact that you've made all reasonable attempts to do so? You know, I mean, at, at, and at, then at that stage, you can take some action. Well, I, I, I was thinking in Edinburgh's case, the answer would be no. I think there are the ones that we are pursuing a CPO, we are pursuing because of the impact in the community. I'm sure if I went back and checked the data, there will be a, a number which is just empty, mm. which are not causing any impact to the community other than the, the loss of the home to the housing supply. And they are probably just sitting there in abeyance, absent any power to... So they can live there until they fall down? Well, they can stand there until they fall down, yeah. Pret Pretty much. Right, okay, right. Okay, thank you. Andy? Thanks very much. Um, th thanks for your written evidence. It's been very useful. Um, I want to look at the question of financial support because I think councils provide schemes of assistance um, and the Scottish Government has in the past provided uh, various schemes. Um, so without going into the detail of your schemes of assistance, which you've given some information on, do you think we need to improve the... Um, uh, financial incentives and the financial support that's available to owners to bring property back into use? I, th I think for our local experience is probably not so much relevant to us, given the buoyancy of the housing market. You know, maybe we deal the issue of providing public funding to homes that are quite buoyant housing market then be sold on. I suspect it may well be more of an issue where um, some of the areas where the housing market is not as strong and communities are feeling that impact. So I'm, I'm not just talking about giving people money. I mean, if, for example, the council tax supplement was to be made a thousand percent and kick in after 10 years. I mean, these kind of financial incentives I'm talking about, as well as grants and loans, etc. I, I suspect, again, the answer probably in Edinburgh would be that any income would probably still be diverted to building affordable housing, given the pressure of the council. The other pressure that this council faces is, of course, short-term lets and the loss of thousands of properties to that. So, again, those are probably more likely to receive... Um, priority rather than grants for empty homes, which is, although it's an important issue and we're not complacent about it, is uh, compared to some of the other issues, not it's as high up in the risks. Okay, others, I mean, if an owner just needs 10 grand or 20 grand to bring a home back into use, are you in a position to assist? Yes, we are. Um, and we've also used the government's interest-free empty um, homes loan fund. Um, as well, that's we've exhausted that too. So our grants and loans um, are always used up, and there's always other demand in the pipeline as well. So, so we you have an annual more. budget that you set yes. for it, and it's always used up. Yes. And are you keeping it the same, or are you attempting to increase um, it? Where, there's, where there is additional funds, they sometimes get a top up during the year, but it's, it has been the same for a few years. And these these are loans, your scheme of assistance? No, there's grants and loans. There's grants. a Scottish Government Empty Home Loan Fund, yep. which is an interest-free loan. And we also have our Empty Homes Initiative grant, which is <coughs> £15,000 um, grant. And are you, finding, grant. are you finding them quite successful in terms of...? Very successful, yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. South Lanarkshire and Falkirk, are you...? Uh, in South Lanarkshire, focuses on information and advice, not a specific loan or grant. Um, but what we would do is signpost if there was any available loans or grants to the individual, we would signpost them to that. But we don't provide a, a budget ourselves. Have you ever provided a scheme of assistance or has it ever been contemplated? Um, there is a scheme of assistance. Um, I would need to come back to you with more information okay. on that. Yep. And we do have, we're part of the Empty Homes Loan Fund, but we've really struggled to spend that, I'll be honest with you. Um, owners are reluctant to give their um, properties up for five years um, for affordable housing. Um, we're reviewing it at the moment, um, and I think what we found is um, owners probably need a grant or a loan to occupy, a loan to occupy rather than you know, to make it available for affordable housing. Um, so we were looking at that. OK, in terms of landlords? Yeah, from, from members' point of view, the Rural Empty Property Grant, which was a grant some years ago, which was exactly like the, the new Empty Homes Loan Fund, <coughs> where you did turn your property over, um, actually I think it was for you know 10 plus years for affordable housing, 
um, was was really useful. I think the you know the private sector housing grants and loan scheme that used to be there, which had everything from a few hundred pounds to deal with a specific problem up to the private you know, the, the rural and property grant, was really useful, um, and it allowed you to deal with all the different. Um, I suppose, the whole spectrum of reasons as to why um, properties were, were empty. Um, the, again, the difficulty is different local authorities take different approaches to this. So you could be in Perth and Kinross and be able to access it, but you could be in another local authority and, and that support just isn't available. So that, that's, the, that's the challenge from a landowner's point of view, is the, is the inconsistency of, of support that's available. Fund you're talking about was a national fund. Uh, that that was a national fund. Um, that that one definitely was. It was a national fund from from Scot Community Scotland, I think it was at the time. And was that ever evaluated? And um, I don't know if there was an official evaluation. There, there may have been, but it was kind of subsumed within to, to new funds. But the, the, these funds really are focused on new build. Um, and they seem to work a lot better for, for new build and for bringing properties back into use. So the rural and, rural and islands housing fund that we have just now just doesn't seem to be quite hitting the spot when it comes to empty properties, and I'm not sure why that is. So is it your view, therefore, that we need to look again at the funds available at a national level, which used to be in place, which could assist in bringing homes back into use? I think so. I think when you have targeted schemes rather than these sort of broad schemes, which you know can, can, can cover any kind of housing, when you have targeted schemes to, to um, address a real problem, um, they, they do seem to work. And we, we still have properties um, across Scotland which were brought back into use as a result of these, and they're still afford, uh, providing affordable housing 20-odd um, years later. OK, thanks very much. I just want to ask about... Um, VAT. Um, Sarah Jane, you say in your uh, submission on page six, sorry, it might be our page six, I think it's your page two, um, that uh, when you're refurbishing a long term let, VAT cannot be reclaimed. Um, but then, uh, Falkirk Council, you say that there is a, an HMRC incentive scheme where an owner of a property empty for two years or more can apply for a letter to prove the property's been empty. And then if it has been um, and renovations are carried out by a VAT registered trader, they may be eligible for a reduced VAT rate of 5%. And if it's 10 years empty, zero. So I'm not quite sure if both are you, if, if you're saying something different or, I, I or think, not. I think we're probably talking about the same thing. I think it's, it's different VAT treatments depending on where your property is in that kind of spectrum of emptiness. Um, if, if that makes sense. Um, and and it, do, it does appear that the longer you leave it empty, the, the more chance you have of HMRC having a slightly different approach to your, to your VAT, which seems counterintuitive to what we're trying to address here. So that, that, that seems to be the, the feedback from, from, from the members in terms of VAT. So Falkirk Council's evidence says that if you have two years or more, you can get discount of 5 to 5%. 5 that that would be helpful. Because if, if, you, if you get nothing at six months and nine months, you leave your property empty for two years to trigger your 5% VAT. That, 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 that seems counterintuitive. No, I understand that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That is certainly is the case because we give out letters confirming how long properties have been empty for, where, la where property owners can provide that to their contractor and they, they just pay 5% on the invoice. They don't have to reclaim it or anything. Um, but we don't really see many people holding their property for two years just so that they can get it. I must say it's normally long-term empty properties that are being brought back into use. I think that's very helpful. OK, thanks. Um, on, on the question of data, I mean, we have data from the National Records of Scotland. Um, we have data from the assessors, uh, which councils hold on, on, on council tax liabilities. Um, the Empty Homes Partnership told us last week that they're embarking a project to better... To, to improve the availability of data, particularly to, at, a, at, a, at a more detailed level, to know exactly where empty homes are spatially. Um, do you as councils know where all the empty homes in your council area are? As opposed to just a gross number? Um, yes, we do know where they are. We've got addresses um, and we can sort of put that on a GIS and have a look at them and we have done that. It hasn't been terribly helpful. It seems to be all the settlements within our council area have empty properties and spread across the rural area, so there wasn't any particular area that showed up as a particular problem. But we do know, but how accurate it is, I'm not sure, because there's always properties, you know, property owners don't want to admit to the council that the property is empty, so that, because they would have to be 200%. 
So according to council tax, a property may be occupied, but actually it's not. So we can't say that the information we have is absolutely accurate. And it's hard to do know you, how Do you have any idea how many people might be failing to disclose that it's empty a, for fear of getting a... A small number that we've come across, but I'm sure there's a lot more okay. out there. Any other issues around data? I think we've just recently, in our most recent report, been asked by elected members to do that exercise of look at it per ward of the council to see if there was any particular hotspots. And I think our experience perhaps might be slightly different, that it appears to be fairly consistent across all the wards within the council, but slightly more in the city centre. But uh, generally, there, there was no discernible pattern that we, but we have gone through that exercise. But uh, as my colleague said, that's based on people who are known um, and being charged the surcharge or in that category, uh, whereas if you are not known to the council or the assessor or haven't declared, then that's, you know, I hesitate to use unknown unknowns, but this is that kind of large number there. We have come across, like my colleague, a small number where we have detected and obviously surcharged on that basis, but you know, to what extent authorities can actively look out empty homes in order to charge the surcharge is questionable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we know where they are, we have the addresses, um, we've analysed that, um, and there's no particular area other than potentially some uh, rural areas where um, it's around a mismatch between supply and demand. It's, it's wider than, you know, the issues are wider than empty homes. It's around, um, let's say, a mismatch, um, just due to changes in population, economic changes. It's a much wider structural problem than... Um, the empty homes, but the empty homes are a part of that, a feature of it. But other than that, the, you know, the understanding where the empty homes are didn't didn't throw up any particular areas other than a, a question around rural. It may not rural. throw up any particular obvious areas spatially, but it does allow you to um, make contact or attempt to make contact yeah. with owners and find out if there's any um, patterns yeah. in terms of why they're empty. Uh, and that presumably depends on how much resource you have to do that yeah. through empty homes officers or any other, any other service. Means. Yeah. Okay. I'm just wondering, as a matter, I mean, this is just an anecdote, but tw 25 years ago, there's, a, there's an empty house on the outskirts of Edinburgh. 25 years ago, we wrote to the landowner asking if um, we could buy it to improve it. Uh, and they said, no, uh, today it's still empty. Uh, I'm just wondering, as a matter of principle, whether that's right. You know, whether someone should be allowed to leave a property empty for 25 years. They're not really using the committee to put in a bid for it, are you? <coughs> Sorry, They're not using the committee to put in a bid for it, are you? No, 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 I'm not, not interested anymore, but uh, just as a matter of principle. I, I certainly, Max, from my perspective, uh, tolerance of empty homes appears to be reducing, and certainly if, if you take our council, I suspect it's probably one of the properties that's on our problem hit list in terms of ones that we are concerned with. I think 10 years ago, it wouldn't have been on anybody's radar in terms of a problem in terms of empty homes, maybe in terms of antisocial behaviour, perhaps. Um, but certainly my sense is that certainly politically in the environment that I work in, it's less acceptable and there's more willingness to use some of the other powers which we spoke about earlier. If that house can be part of the effective housing supply, then no, there's no excuse for it being empty for that long. Okay. Excuse for that being empty. Yeah. So, in principle, we should be looking at means, whether through finance or fiscal incentives or um, enforcement powers or acquisition powers, to bring all property that is empty into use. As a matter of public policy, that should be our goal. We're all agreed on that. I, I think the only exception is where those properties, as, as, as someone said earlier, are in areas where the, the housing need is a mismatch with the housing supply. So you know, bringing seven, eight bedroom properties back into use when the demand is for one and two bedroom flats just doesn't seem right, unless you convert that property. Yep. And the conversion of some of those properties is, is fairly pro problematic. And planning has been turned down in some areas for the conversion of, of large houses. Um, so, so that's only... I suppose that's the only situation where you, you, you might, you know, bringing it back into use in its current form might not be the best approach. Okay. I, I would say, 
definitely yes, subject to there being proper controls to protect people's rights so that, you know, if you look at the range of powers that councils have, they all have a check and balance in terms of to make sure that they're used appropriately. So subject to that, then I see no reason why an empty home should be continued to sit there as an asset. So in Edinburgh, for example, you're saying that because the market's buoyant, potentially it's not so much of a problem. But you did say earlier that you're focusing on problem on, on empty homes that are identified through p people that come to you saying it's a problem. But there are empty homes sitting there that are not a problem, but they're still a problem in the sense that they're out of the housing supply. So is it will it be Edinburgh's intention to bring all empty homes back, or to do as much as it can to bring every empty home back into use? I can't prejudge what the, the council will do once we see the powers, but I think the council has given a commitment to look positively at the powers. And, you know, as I say, if you look at some of the issues we face in terms of short term lets, it is a, an acute concern in Edinburgh the amount of properties that, one way or another, are being lost to the supply of affordable housing in the city and making what is already a challenging environment more difficult. So I can't imagine that the council wouldn't look at those positively. Okay, thanks. thanks Just as before, I bring in Alexander Stewart. Uh, this is for you, Sarah Jane. Uh, why do you think there are proportionately more empty homes, properties in rural areas? I think some of it has to do with market failure. I mean, we mentioned before that the, the properties which were in the rural areas might not meet them, the, the modern demand, um, either in terms of um, size, location, um, Scale quality is a big issue. Um, I think if you look at the, you know, the the, the Scottish House Condition Survey, the quality of some of um, Scotland's rural properties is is very poor. So some of them are sitting um, empty just now, waiting awaiting renovation. Um, and some of it is is because of strange um, links to other pieces of legislation, whether that's agricultural holdings legislation or other bits and pieces. And sometimes housing legislation doesn't fit with other stuff, and what it then results in is is empty houses. And that's something that we're you know we're trying to address with the Scottish government and others, because it's wrong to have farm cottages sitting empty. But at the same time, if you've got farmers and others who are reluctant to have people in the middle of farming um, operations um, because of either health and safety or, or other issues, you kind of understand why a property might be empty, but then we have to kind of look at, well, how, how does that property meet housing needs? How do you support the, the farmer? How do you support the estate in making that available? So there's no one reason. Um, I, again, I think as somebody sort of said earlier, there are so many reasons, and I think as, but, but it's com further complicated in, in, in the rural areas because of this interplay with agricultural holdings. What about the effectiveness of the loan funds uh, or the Scottish Government's Rural and Island Housing Fund tackling these empty properties? I think as I touched on earlier, the, the, um, the, the Rural and Islands house, Housing Fund hasn't quite hit, hit the mark. Um, again, because of the... Um, the obstacles of, of applying, it's not just individual, it's very difficult for an individual just to apply to, to, to the loan fund, um, which means it's, it's probably more suited to larger scale development. And by large scale, you know, I mean sort of four or five new houses, not, not massive scale. Whereas the Rural Empty Property Grant and some of the Scottish, um, some of the local authority grants were very targeted at individual properties. Um, and because most of these are a property by property basis, that's why they worked better um, in terms of tackling the empty homes. Advice on how they could make it more applicable for single houses? Um, I, I think changing the eligi eligibility criteria for who can, who can apply, um, although I appreciate that with, with, as with any um, government loan fund, you have to have that, you know, that kind of high barrier to access public funds. But if you're, if you're restricting um, access to, to groups, companies, um, constituted bodies rather than individuals, then it's unlikely to hit some of these um, rural empty properties that, that we're talking about. OK, thank you for that. Alexander, do you want to...? Yep, yeah, we, we, we've already had some discussion this morning about the, the housing strategy uh, and the links that there may well be. So can I maybe ask each of you uh, how sufficiently joined up is this the, the empty home strategy uh, linked uh, with the wider uh, housing strategies uh, to ensure that you get that need? Because there obviously is a disparity at the moment between what you want, what you have, and what you can achieve. Who wants to go first? 
Um, we don't actually have an empty home strategy. Our empty home strategy is embedded in the local housing strategy, so it is just one, and that's where our target for bringing back empty properties lies. So but do you do you think that's robust enough? Do you think that is sufficient enough to have? Or, uh, because in other locations, this the, there are the two. Um, I think it works well with for us, you for us. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, it's funny, you, you, you touched on earlier about how the strategies were linked. Uh, like my colleague here, it's, it's a, our approach to empty homes is embedded within our local housing strategy. So we see our local housing strategy as being our, encompassing our overall approach to housing supply and demand and creating, our, um, contributing to balanced housing markets. Um, and that's that. That's why that's why we've taken the approach that we have. And in amongst all of that, there has been some budgetary funding that's helped to try and assess that uh, from from the strategy that you're trying to put together. Yes, I would say so. Yes, um, I, I, and I don't. I'm not wanting to go back to the, the previous question, but I think one of the things that we haven't really talked about this morning yet is housing sustainability. Um, and that's where I think the kind of having a, a wider focus is is a benefit. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about rural communities and perhaps there being a mismatch between supply and demand, um, I think one of our you know the approach that, that we're taking through our local housing strategy is to think about sustainability. How do we ensure the future sustainability of um, the housing? within these communities and making sure that it's fit for purpose. And sometimes that can be about consolidation rather than always wanting to bring, you know, every property. It, it might be that actually there's an oversupply in particular areas or an oversupply of a particular type or a particular size. So I think, you know, we, we find that's a benefit where we can actually link it back to well, what what's sustainable within that community and what is going to be best for the residents of that community. Okay. But we are doing a piece on empty homes, is it, which is why that's been our focus. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, of course. Um, Falkirk does have an empty homes plan and it's also embedded within the local housing strategy as well. Um, we're reviewing our empty homes plan this year, um, but um, empty homes is it's actually within our housing supply target. We've got a target for bringing back empty homes within our local housing strategy. So, and, and, and once again, do you have enough resource to fund that from from your original budget, or have you, are you bringing extra funds in to try and make that happen? Um, I'll be honest; I'm not sure. Okay. Um, and Edinburgh? I, I suppose empty homes is clearly embedded within our overall approach to housing supply and housing strategy it is but one of a number of issues that the council is currently challenged by so mm -hmm. uh, we're considering rent pressure zones we're yep. considering the impact of short-term lets empty homes an important factor our approach to mixed tenure in terms of you know improving the standard within those blocks where if there are owner occupiers how you deal with them so it is an important part of that i think in terms of resources available resources are stretched across all those yeah. fronts so um, i think empty homes is competing against a, num a range of good causes within that basket of um, issues which the council is trying to maximize the impact of its strategy and actions in order to improve this uh, situation. And, and you've, you've all identified today having the dedicated support uh, and having that mechanism there uh, to ensure that that does become the case uh, will make a massive impact and has made a massive impact in your communities and your councils already. Yeah, so so that that, that so it's a no-brainer in reality. You know, by by investing in this and supporting it, uh, it is making a big difference. Uh, and we've already heard what's been happening elsewhere in the United Kingdom about how they've tackled some of these uh, policies and have have developed very very good uh, abilities to, to to make things happen. But it has to be focused and it has to be financially uh, viable and supported to make it develop effectively in your own communities. Yes. Okay, thank you.
Just uh, um, on the issue of taxation, which is in the Scottish Land Estates um, submission, uh, I mean, we, we touched on VAT earlier, which is a reserve, which is reserved, and uh, in your submission you talk about capital gains tax, which is also reserved. But I'm just wondering what change you would like to see in that, in capital gains. Um, I, I don't think we were suggesting there should be any change. I think we were just um, outlining what. I what the taxation levers or, or uh, taxation considerations are at the moment in terms of um, property owners deciding to leave their property empty, empty or not. There weren't any specific taxation changes that we, we thought could be made. Okay. It, it just, it, from what I, I kind of read, a kind of frustration, basically, and it, that's why I asked the question, as you say, and you, uh, um, if, however, the accommodation would be retained as a tied house or rented it as a holiday home, it would have been eligible for agricultural business relief. So it's almost as if you feel the same kind of um, consideration should be given towards uh, uh, you know, other properties. Well, landowners are always frustrated with the taxation system, right. but I think what we were, we were trying to sort of draw out there was this this, um, I suppose, disparity of, of treatment between something which is, again, back to the agricultural holdings, you know, is yeah. it a property in a farm or is it, is it a house? Um, and there's a number of cases where, um, where judgments would suggest that there's, there's different treatments of, of houses which are deemed to be part of the farm and ones which are, mm -hmm. which are not. I'm just curious as to, given, given those points that you've just raised, that you don't want to see any real change in the regime then? It's one of those, um, I suppose it's one of those really complicated, well, not complicated ones, that there might be changes which would um, be advantageous in terms of bringing empty properties back into mm -hmm. use, but would be disadvantageous um, from a farm sale. Right. So it's, it's looking at those um, altogether. There, there might be taxation levers that if you looked at um, the empty homes um, aspect of it could act as a lever, but we then have to understand what the implications that might be for properties which are part of, of farms and estate sales as well. Okay, so you think the balance is right then at the moment? I, I think um, I think it probably is, but I think we'd have to sort of do some modelling just to see how okay. many properties are actually would fall within the residential and how many properties would fall within the, the farm and the, the agricultural property relief okay. element of it. It just shows that it, it, it just shows them for, I think for us the Taxation is not about delivering social policy, and that's a frustration. Um, I suppose that's a, a kind of wider frustration that, that um, trying to um, trying to get HMRC to think about taxation from a, um, a social policy point of view, to do, from a housing point of view, something we've tried to do for a while. Um, it, it seems ludicrous that um, you can get IHT conditional exemptions for pieces uh, works of art, but you can't get them for affordable housing, mm -hmm. uh, which is an asset which is arg arguably more public interest than. Than, than some of the, the, the national pieces of um, works of art. And again, this is just, you know, we were raising the fact that you, you have taxation, which seems to be treating different houses differently. Yeah. Um, and it's something we could look at. Ms. Fines, anyone else to get any comment on this particular area? Yes, Mr Mitchell. Uh, just maybe an observation that I suppose any changes to tax rules to incentivise empty homes being brought on back into use should be about use as a home. Um, we have a separate concern about the tax system incentivising people to have short-term lets, so mm -hmm. we'd need to be careful that any change didn't make that problem um, worse. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And can I now thank the panel very much for uh, attending today's session. That was very useful for us. Next steps in the inquiry will be to make a visit to East Ayrshire to visit communities impacted by empty homes. And we'll also have a private discussion on today's evidence on, and on the next steps at the end of this meeting. So thanks very much again for your attendance. And I pause briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the table.